Okay, so in terms of how uh, this session will work, we're going to start with uh, my colleagues, um, Andy Ewell and David Tyfield, who will present the work. Um, and we'll then have responses from our panel. Um, we've got Tom Noland, who's Head of Sustainable Energy and Climate Change from Leeds City Council. We've got Councillor Joanna Mowat, who's from Edinburgh City Council. We've got uh, Councillor Seamus de Fuita, who's from Belfast City Council. And we've got Polly Billington um, from UK 100, which is a charity who work on local climate leadership across a whole range of different local areas. Um, so we'll have a, a panel discussion. They'll give their responses to the research and we'll look at how uh, this is working in the three cities that we studied, Leeds, Edinburgh and Belfast. Um, and then we're open for more questions and debate. So get going with that in the chat and I'll pick out some themes. Um, and then the unenviable job of sum, sum, summing all this up goes to Candice Howarth, who is a um, senior research fellow for the PCAN network. Uh, and I promise it'll be tough, but I promise we'll finish by 11.30 at the latest. Okay, so um, if, there, if, uh, if everyone's happy with that agenda, I'm going to pass over to my colleagues, David and Andy, to present the findings. Thank you. Great, thanks, Becky. Um, Andy, do you want to share the screen? So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm David Tyfield. Uh, I'm Professor of uh, Sustainable Transitions and Political Economy at the Lancaster Environment Centre. Um, and uh, with my colleague, Dr. Andy Yule, uh, we're going to present the findings from our uh, project. So, Andy, first slide, please. Um, as Becky said, the, the, the goal of our project was to explore uh, with local government uh, what next after declaring the climate emergency. And of course, as many of you will be well aware, this isn't just a challenge of unprecedented ambition in terms of the mountain still to be climbed, but also starting in very testing circumstances after a decade of austerity, uh, and now with COVID coming along, adding to those burdens, including the financial burdens. But of course, what to do about climate emergency is itself, in any case, a highly complex problem, not least for those tasked uh, with the responsibility for doing something about it. The juggling of conflicting pressures or interests, uh, priorities and responsibilities, many of which will be pre-existing and indeed statutory. So how do these all fit into the picture? Uh, we can't just, as it were, throw the kitchen sink um, at climate change. And with all, within all of this, what we see is, again, as Becky said, uh, is a crucial neglected agenda where much has rightly been written about what needs to be done. And I think we have increasingly clear uh, picture on that in terms of a long-term goal. But how such changes to be made, uh, are to be made and can be made by those who have to make them uh, is not given as much attention. But local government is a key arena and scale uh, for dealing with climate emergency, climate action, and where the missing piece in all of this temporarily uh, is the medium term. Everyone tasked with these pro uh, problems knows what they have to do next in the next couple of weeks or months, and they know what the long-term ambition is increasingly. But how to join those up, how to get from here to there is not so clear. Next slide, please. So just a, a quick uh, introduction to our uh, research process. The starting point here is that let's take a step back and look at the predicament. We face unprecedented complex and uncertain challenges, and that means that we have to cultivate new ways of working because the existing ways of working are on the one hand, not up to the challenge, but also in many ways have incubated the problem in the first place. But we can't start afresh, but not least because of time pressure, we have to build on something. So that means building optimally on the existing capacities that are already there. In effect, what this means is that what we're trying to do here is to cultivate with those uh, responsible for uh, expediting this agenda, their existing and often unconsciously competent expertise or practical wisdom, uh, which is called also phrenesis. And this changes both the means and the ends of a research project. In terms of the means, the goal is uh, not simply to uh, gather data and then present it back, but to enter into a process of collective foregrounding 
and therefore challenging the tacit knowledge uh, of what works and in the specific location and place uh, that these place uh, um, and time that these people find themselves in, where questions of sequencing, questions of opportunity uh, are absolutely crucial. This also changes the ends of research project that again, we're not trying to get the answer right, probably because there is no single answer, but rather to develop through careful strategic exploration of the lived present towards an imaginative and constructive reassessment of the ways of working. In concrete terms, what this meant was that we first of all conducted interviews, five uh, with uh, three senior officers and two elected councillors in our, in our three PCAM cities of Belfast, Edinburgh and Leeds. We transcribed that uh, inductively uh, brought out codes and turned this into a briefing paper, which we then shared in a broader workshop uh, with um, those at the councils, uh, which further discussed these uh, uh, insights. This then led to um, a space, uh, the, the goal throughout was uh, to provide space and support for practitioners to uh, reflect strategically, so as precisely to develop the ability uh, to envisage and even have confidence about the way forward through the medium term. What then did, uh, what then arose in the first instance? In all three cities and with many parties, we found first of all, that climate emergencies were declared uh, sincerely, that the political priorities were shifted over the last couple of years and that climate clearly has risen, risen up the political agenda. However, um, immediately that posed challenges, that new ambitions rose, uh, with new ambitions rose challenges of implementation. Um, how to actually deliver on them was uh, the, 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 the rub uh, in all cases. A source of dismay and some disappointment and uh, confusion also was the, the division of responsibilities and powers between national and local. And by national, we here in particular mean Westminster. So there, there is the added uh, complication here uh, of Edinburgh and Scotland, of Northern Ireland and Belfast. A crucial aspect of the ability uh, to actually expedite or drive forward the agenda though in all these cultures, uh, in all these councils, sorry, uh, was the organizational culture. How well do they work together within themselves across departments? How well do they work together with stakeholders, both business, business and civic? And a key further issue was the need to frame the issue in a way uh, that uh, brought people along with it that green action was not clearly uh, going to uh, work as a hair shirt agenda, uh, that it needed to be portrayed in a way that simply it was the best future for the city. Nonetheless, in terms of act, um, ambition and implementation, the, 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 rubber hit, the, the rubber hits the road, it seems, when actual decisions need to be taken. When a bike lane needs to be introduced here, car parking or something else needs to be removed there. At this point, this is when interests arise uh, and certain amounts of latent objection to the climate agenda come to the fore. Clearly, uh, doing these interviews in 2020 as well, COVID also raised its ugly head uh, and there was both some trepidation, but also some uh, optimism about what could happen going forward uh, out of COVID. In terms of trepidation, people were worried that the need for a stimulus might bury the uh, green agenda altogether. And then last, but by no means least, and coming out most clearly from the workshops rather than the interviews, was the need for place-based narratives in terms of uh, the framing of the issue regarding things that actually will mean something and will be locally understandable to all participants and residents in those particular places. Andy, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, David. Okay, so that's a high level overview of the what's, the, the challenges and the opportunities that our participants raised. But from a frenetic perspective, we wanted to get to grips with how people were responding to these challenges. Now, none of our participants was opposed to climate action, and they described overt opposition as being very rare, which is a, a very recent development. Um, but there are still a range of more subtle breaks on change. We saw clear patterns emerging from the interviews in the ways that people engaged with the climate problem and with these constraints. 
which we categorized into four discrete personas, which I will describe in the next slide. These don't represent individuals, but rather distinct ways of working. So some people might enact all of these personas in response to different situations. Others might stick quite close to one or two. But the crucial point is that whilst all of them are necessary to deliver climate action, the balance in which they are held, the emphasis given to each, both individually and institutionally, in particular situations is vital, as they all also hold the potential to delay or frustrate action. Um, the workshop participants thought this typology provided a useful framework to think through both individual and institutional responses to the challenges that, that David's just described. So these insights about how people engage with climate action can resituate and reframe our understanding of what the challenges are and make them available to be engaged with differently. So we describe these four personas as crusaders, entrepreneurs, pragmatists and weavers. Crusaders firstly are, are on a mission to embed climate action across the council and beyond to change what is seen as doable. Right. They work at a strategic level, often across departments and often with external stakeholders. And they see their role as getting the message out, changing the culture, establishing climate action as an urgent priority that can't be ignored or sidelined or compromised away. Now, entrepreneurs kind of duck and dive and weave and use their knowledge about people, about situations and about how things work to seek out opportunities to promote climate action. They look for synergies with existing programmes and priorities to show how they can be delivered together with climate action and look for ways around apparent obstacles and conflicts. Pragmatists do recognise the importance of climate action, but they also maintain a strong focus on other objectives and they may perceive climate as colonising or being detrimental to other agendas. Uh, they tend to have a strong focus on process and procedure, you know, on the nuts and bolts of how things are actually getting done. And finally, weavers focus on collaboration and connections. They try to mesh together the high level aims that everyone can agree with, with the often controversial measures that will actually achieve them. And they emphasise building and maintaining trust and support within and beyond the council. Uh, bringing together ideas, approaches and people that may otherwise be in conflict. So that's a, a rough sketch of the topology that we developed. How do we go forward from here in delivering climate action at a local level? Firstly, obviously, we'd encourage people to make use of the topology developed during this project. So by bringing these personas to presence and paying attention to the different roles and functions they perform, the idea is to make them available to adopt and adapt as conscious strategies to help deliver climate action. So rather than being tacit or intuitive ways of working, they can be intentionally combined at institutional and individual levels in situation specific ways and also used as a, like a lens through which to understand and respond to the action of colleagues and other stakeholders. Uh, we'd also advocate a frenetic approach more widely uh, for both researchers and practitioners to dive into the predicament and attempt to understand it from the inside, rather than simply seeking solutions that can be externally imposed. Yeah, we absolutely need the, the hard science and the technologies, the stretching targets and the strong policy, but none of that is enough in itself. We need to better understand how this looks and how it feels from the perspectives of the people, the teams and the institutions that will make it happen and to learn from their experience of how things work. There's a clear need for both local and national government to acknowledge the, the rapid and far ranging, genuinely radical change that's needed to, to open up a space for a more honest and open debate about the implementation gap, right? The still vast uncharted distance between the current state of play and the net zero ambitions and how we might find ways to navigate across it. National government should set a framework for local areas that makes their respective responsibilities on climate clear and resource them properly to deliver on that, but also leaving flexibility to allow local areas to develop their own locally specific responses. And local areas do need to be prepared for the overall aim of responding meaningfully to the climate emergency 
to conflict with existing procedures and priorities and to actively create mechanisms to flag up and work through the implications and potential solutions to these conflicts rather than trying to work around them or, or even avoid them. And lastly, we need to recognize the vital role for local politicians and officials using their own experience and understanding to develop and advocate ways forward. So the participants in this study and uh, this project found it helpful to reflect on the challenges and dilemmas they face outside of the daily grind. And this sort of support and opportunity could be provided more widely, separate from existing management or strategy processes to help de develop working cultures, which allow for a much more full and frank and honest discussion about how best to respond to the climate emergency. So just to, to wrap up, this is the way that one of our workshop participants described her visual representation of future climate policy with a net zero, a distant summit and the council at the bottom of the hill. So as David has said, there's, there's clarity about the immediate actions we need to take. There's clarity about the end state we want to reach, but the all important medium term leading from one to the other is still unmapped and unknown territory. And our, our contention is that a frenetic approach will help both practitioners and researchers navigate this difficult medium term or middle ground, this foggy and noisy hillside through a process of ongoing practical learning. And I think we have time for questions now. So I'm going to unshare my screen and hand back over to Becky. Great. Thank you very much. Yes, we'll have uh, plenty of time for your questions and discussion. Before I open it out to, uh, to everybody, I'm going to ask our panel to respond. Um, thank you very much, Andy and David, for uh, a, a, a really enlightening and efficient run through of, of the research. Um, you should also have all received a copy of the briefing, which gives you a little bit more detail about the research. And um, for, for, for those among you who, who, who like a good peer reviewed journal, there will hopefully be one of those out at some point as well. Um, so um, I'm going to, um, I'm going to start just by going to each of our panel and asking them to um, pick out something that really struck them about the report. One thing that we found actually talking to people about it is that people instantly start thinking, oh, which one of those am I? And uh, I've, I've, I, it just struck me that maybe we should do a quiz. Um, like in the teenage magazines of old, we could do a quiz to see which of those personas are you. Um, but seriously, I think it is interesting to reflect on, on our own styles when we're working on, on, on climate issues. Um, but uh, there's, there's no, no obligation to do that panel. Um, I'm just going to come to you each in turn and ask you to just, just reflect on one thing that really, um, that really struck you or that you were surprised by in the research. So um, I'm gonna go to Tom first. Um, Tom Noland, would you like to um, give us a sentence or two on what struck you? Thanks. Uh, thank you. Yes. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly not in the market for teenage magazines um, <laughs> long ago. However, um, I think I think those those four kind of uh, characters that you you described they, those did ring very true. I mean, I think and at, at different points in in my career, I think I've played all four different roles. And in fact, I think uh, for people working in this space, you need to have the the ability to uh, work uh, across all of those different um, kind of tactical approaches. Um, it, it, it's uh, you won't you won't succeed just by just by following uh, one option. Or so if you can't cover all those bases yourself, you need a team um, that, that that does. Um, and, and of course, lots of local authorities. This role is often a one person band so they, they maybe need to multitask in that respect i think what struck me i think and, and it's linked to that is that um i think this 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 kind of a role in a local authority um it is a it it, it is a skillful professional role and i wouldn't want the report or the research to give the impression that somehow this is a kind of you know you're a bit of a chancer you know that you're just kind of um pursuing this you know just because you're enthusiastic about it um i think 
and, and increasingly it's important I think that um, that this is recognized as a, a, a definite sort of professional skill because it, this is a difficult area and it won't happen uh, just by people thinking it ought to happen and it's a good idea. You do need to understand the policy challenge, the science challenge, and particularly the organizational challenge that this uh, that this embraces so just as any other person who's trying to change an organization of kind of like from the inside that might be say around equalities and diversity or health and safety or whatever you do need uh, uh, um, that's that sort of skill set and that to have that sort of professionally backed up and seen as a legitimate task i think is important so i think that that to me you know sort so of speaking personally um it's quite easy, you know, because this kind of role grew out of, you know, quite junior sort of type of activities. It'd be quite easy to dismiss it, but actually, it is a serious, um, a serious uh, set of skills and tasks that you're you're talking about. That's probably enough for me for the moment. Thanks. Yeah, and that that definitely echoes what we found in our interviews that there was, you know, some really um, a lot of experimentation actually um, about how best to drive a complex agenda through a complex organisation and, and that maybe there isn't enough um, enough acknowledgement of the, the, the skill needed to, to do that. Thank you. Um, I'll come to Joanna now. Does this, uh, how does this strike you from the perspective of someone who's actually trying to get this stuff done in Edinburgh? Oh, let me just... You'll just need to unmute yourself, Joanna. There you go. Right. Has that worked? Yeah. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Um, I suppose Tom's the professional arm of this because he's a council officer. I'm the non-professional arm of this. And I saw a bit in the chat about um, people saying councillors didn't come in to do this. The, the frustration that I think um, the, the councillors and for, for me in the context of working in Scotland is that we have declared a climate emergency in our council. We have declared a climate emergency at Holyrood, but we don't necessarily have the, um, the policy backup to say, take this forward. I think I froze a bit there. Have you? It's fine, we can hear you fine, don't worry. Right, okay. Um, so the, the difficulty uh, for, for, for me is that we have declared this as an emergency by act of council, we've declared this, the government is saying this, we, our timelines aren't aligned, but there's been no practical decisions to say, actually, it takes so long to produce new plans, a new planning framework, a new national transport framework. So I don't have the authority within the statutory environment to motor on and probably take this forward so you've still got all the other statutory duties that you need to do you've got all that environment you need to work in and there we were yesterday doing our audit plan for next year for 21 22 well the audit we haven't com completed this year because they weren't in the right place to do it so there was no point auditing them from this year's internal audit was the sustainability and climate change project now that's got a time scale on it of less than 10 years yeah. And the organisation can't align itself. And I'm sorry, but COVID and, and, and all that, this, this predates the decision in Edinburgh. It was 2019. It, it predates COVID. And we've got a slippage of over a year on our local plan, which is going to help us deliver buildings. And for me, that is actually the priority uh, because I think transport is largely going to take care of itself. It's going to be difficult doing those details we were in quite a good place for that, actually, where we are in Edinburgh, from a point of view of how people are taking journeys, we're in a much better place for that. And a combination of market forces and, and policy tweaks and government giving us some more money for electric buses and sorting that technology out. I can see how that can happen. What I have got a real problem with and where I need real movement in the policy is planning and housing, because it's cold in Scotland. You know, we, we, yeah. we've got a problem. We've got all this historic housing, which makes us a world heritage city. And apparently we've got to electrify our, 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 we need to electrify or gasify our heating source. But you can't not heat in Edinburgh because it puts people into, you know, and if you just go to electrification, 
it's fuel, you're putting people into fuel poverty. So there's a whole load of stuff, but it's the policy agenda, the wider strategic agenda needing to move faster to support us in this, because at the moment, there is that in a huge tension between what we've got to deliver statutorily and what we need to deliver to deliver climate change and, and government. We're on the doorstep. People are asking us to do this, actually. They know that a lot of people know the challenges and are interested and have watched David Attenborough and seen Greta Thunberg and say, there is a problem. We need to move forward. What are you doing? And you're sitting there going, well, actually, I'd like to do this, but I can't ask for that because I can't enforce it because I'll be thrown out by another level of government if I say you've got to electrify it. All houses have got to be built with yeah. no um, no fossil fuels. Can't do it. Great. And that's the situation. Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, what I'm taking from that is is partly the sort of the the um distance between wanting to set that political priority and your statutory duties but also the sort of sheer difficulty of clashing cogs of different strategies and plans and and how you you know how you know how how whether you try to get those all aligned or whether you try and work with clashing cogs and somehow manage to get the machine going despite the clashing cogs um sorry did you want to come back on that yeah, just probably my biggest blocker actually to do anything at the moment is it's the, the culture of the council is a very big and complex organisation, so this is difficult. And actually someone needs to go in there and say, yes, it is, but actually other big and complex organisations just attack it. And I think it's the lack of attack and urgency. Yeah. OK. That's interesting. Seamus, I could see you nodding on that. Would you like to come in and, and say how things look from the point of view of Belfast? Oh, you just need to unmute Seamus. There we go. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Rebecca. And I, I kind of find myself really agreeing with what Joanna was saying there about some of the obstacles that are thrown up uh, in the path and certainly size and scale of organisations uh, is one of the most frequent ones uh, and that I think kind of rings true just to some of the, the <coughs> analysis around at Belfast that's contained within the report um, uh, to, to Rebecca and others who were involved and putting together will, will know that one of my hobby horses is about trying to build in the environmental and climate implications of our decisions into our decision making process uh, and we already have a kind of significant um, uh, a styled approach around uh, equality and good relations issues. Obviously, Northern Ireland having a very um, unique set of circumstances that have to be considered in relation to uh, what we would describe as, as good relations uh, and equality issues uh, already. So, you know, to, to some extent, um, there is form for this for us on a different policy or subject matter and what what we are trying to do or what we are trying to to encourage our officers and others to pick up on is to follow through with that then in terms of uh, the policy area around climate and, and i noticed from some of the questions in the chat about um you know things like decisions that councils are taking that kind of go uh, against the grain of the decision to declare a climate emergency and against the grain of all of the the good work that is taking place in local government on climate action and i, I think that comes down to is that more work does need to be done to present the implications of decisions to leaders in local government because there is no doubt about it in Belfast and, and certainly you knowing other colleagues in local government in the UK and Ireland and other parts of Europe, people come into local government for different reasons and very few people come in as experts on the issue of climate. And it has to be within the power of local authority to, to give their elected members the most amount of information that they can to make the best informed decision that they can uh, about uh, both policy and in, in terms of practical uh, uh, measures. Uh, we are kind of limited in terms of the, the kind of practical side of things. Uh, local government in Northern Ireland is pretty restricted in terms of the authorities and responsibility that we have. And I think it was fairly conclusive from the conversations that we had 
uh, in preparation for, for this report in Belfast that we would like to see more uh, responsibility given to local government in Northern Ireland to deal with some of these issues. Uh, for example, we are not the transit authority uh, in Northern Ireland. We would probably like to see some form of uh, uh, transit authority rules passed down to us, particularly in terms of active travel, uh, because we certainly feel that local government would be able to move faster on some of those changes rather than a, a Northern Ireland-wide focus. Um, you know, we, we would like to see um, more powers in relation to energy issues as well, and particularly in terms of how we can col collaborate with local communities around um, energy storage and wealth creation, local localised wealth creation for, for community organisations and community groups. So, uh, you know, to, to kind of sum up where Belfast is, we had done a lot of good work in terms of preparing um, the ground for our uh, climate mitigation and adaptation plan. And I know John Barry is on the call here, so John would probably be better placed uh, uh, as the co-chair of the Belfast Climate Commission to, to give some more in-depth detail in relation to that. In terms of where the elected members are, many of us feel frustrated that we do not have the ability to, uh, in, in, in terms of the authority, to follow through on some of the changes that we would like to see. And we are engaging with our local communities on these changes on a daily basis. Uh, I mean, 90% of my time is probably dealt with, uh, uh, taken up with dealing with issues around local infrastructure, transit authority issues, um, all of the kind of things that if the council had more power uh, 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 over, that we would probably be able to deliver the greater amount of change in a shorter period of time. Uh, that I think kind of sums up where we kind of are in Belfast. Um, we have a lot of ideas, we just don't have necessarily the authority to follow through on a lot of them. Great, thank you. Yeah, so, you know, a couple of things that really strike me from that are, firstly, I think this, um, you know, again, the, um, the lack of powers at local level, which I think is particularly acute for local government in, in Northern Ireland, but is also, um, a, a case elsewhere in the in the UK, um, but also you mentioned um, you know the really positive role that can be played with communities, and I know that's a theme that's coming up in the chat. So I definitely want to take that forward in in the discussion as well. Um, before we do that, I'm going to hand to uh, Polly because Polly, you and UK 100 have you know the vast experience of working across a whole range of local authorities. So um, what what struck you about our report, and you know how to what extent did it chime with with your experience of of working with local authorities on the front line hi um thank you very much becky i would say first of all the these are three of the most advanced cities uh, belfast is, is signed up to our resilient recovery task force so in that sense, it's part of our wider family of UK 100. And Edinburgh and Leeds are both um, pretty advanced members of our network, and they are experiencing these things, right? So think about the fact that we have over 100 members, and some are like super advanced, like Edinburgh and Leeds, and some are literally just getting started on this. And this is the kind of, uh, these are the kind of challenges that the big advanced cities are experiencing. So when you feel down in the dumps, and I know as a councillor, I'm a councillor, full, full disclosure, um, and you're feeling down in the dumps and you think, why am I spending all of my evenings in meetings with people who just wag their fingers at me and tell me I'm wrong? Um, remember, there are loads of people who are experiencing exactly what you're experiencing, and they're in the best, and they're in some of the best uh, uh, cities um, and local authorities in the country. May I make the observation that it is always extraordinary to find your, your um, personality type analysed like a, like a weird um, uh, Amazonian tribe. Um, I'm a counsellor I, and I work with counsellors and um, it's obviously um, so, so somewhat flattering and I can see everyone sort of responding to the sort of Jackie just 17, oh, am I really a crusader kind of thing. But ultimately, this, we have only been examined in this sort of anthropological way through the climate lens. And the reality is, as counsellors, 
we do loads of other things too. And the most important lesson I think out of this is how you mainstream the council stuff. So it is an integral part of how you do everything else, which includes, let me tell you, working out how in my for in my ward. So I'm not even talking in terms of my UK 100 job, right? I'm talking in terms of my, my backbench ward councillor job dealing with casework, right? Where we have 13,000 people on the, on the waiting list for housing in my borough, 3,000 people in what is called temporary accommodation, right? Some of whom have been there for four or five or six years. We have children who now go to school in living in one room where they were born. And some, and some, and unsurprisingly, when I sit in front of before COVID, when I sat in my surgery in front of a woman having to deal with that, the fact that I next had somebody wagging their finger at me, telling me I wasn't doing enough about the climate emergency, I kind of thought I was quite close to telling them, listen, mate, I've got quite enough on, thanks, right? And I am a climate nut and I spend all day doing climate between nine and six. So remember that during COVID, local authorities were having to make decisions about whether they turned that ice rink into a mortuary. They're also dealing with whether their kids are vulnerable to county lines or, uh, or child sexual, abuse, sexual exploitation. And then we've got climate. So and when I am dealing with my colleagues, when I say I want to work on a just transition and how we're going to be able to regenerate our borough so that we can we can align our jobs and our skills and uh, the needs of our community who've got desperate inequality and so forth. And they go, yeah, what you're going to do with that just transition and your electric vehicles is you're going to take jobs away from uh, our small, medium sized businesses who are car mechanics. And I need to have an answer for that. So that is, that is this, the, the, and I would rather, because those people will, co will call themselves allies and they're basically the pragmatists. They're the yes buts rather than the yes ands. And how do you turn a yes but into a yes and? It's pretty much making sure that you've got some of the solutions to their problem, not just thinking they're gonna solve yours. So I think this is extraordinarily useful research. Let me tell you, basically having somebody doing the academic research to prove what I've been saying for the last 18 months is brilliant. <laughs> frankly, um, and because somebody else has had to do the hard work and all those structured interviews and treated us like a weird Amazonian tribe. <laughs> I think what we now need to do is to see it in the wider context of mainstreaming this, because yes, we, we need all of those typologies and all of those personas uh, to get this stuff done. And we need it to be integrated across the local authorities. I know that we've got members in our network who have got some some responsibility which is not related to climate change and then and climate emergency on the bottom when we say to them well what are you doing about your strategic plan what are you doing about your transport plans they go oh well that's somebody else's responsibility and i'm not powerful enough so when we talk about powers remember this is not necessarily about powers it's about power and having the authority inside your organization to go to the top and say we do this or you will not be able to look your children in the eye or your residents in the eye. That is what you're, you're talking about. And making sure that we don't just say, oh, it's all really difficult. And there's loads of people in the local government who make a profession out of saying it's really difficult. And instead say, how do we transform what the, use the powers that we've got to push right to the limits of that power? And then we will build authority to ask for those rules to be changed. That's what I think we need to do. Great, thank you. Yeah, I think you've articulated really clearly that, I mean, firstly, absolutely the, you know, the pressures that local authorities are under always, but especially at the moment. Um, but I think your way of articulating that as a, um, you know, a, a yes and as, instead of a yes but is, is really important. Okay, I'm going to come to some of the themes that are coming up in, in questions now. There's a couple that, that relate specifically to the research, so I'm going to throw those back at Andy and, and David. Um, one of them is um, uh, asking about the um, co-benefits, whether we looked at the co-benefits of, of sustainable policies and whether they're useful in terms of getting wider buy-in. And uh, that's a question from Caroline Kazemko and another one from John Taylor about whether the research looked at where the climate emergency work sits in the council structure um, and whether it's different depending on whether it's, you know, seen as an economic issue or an environmental protection issue. Um, Andy and David, I'll leave you to slightly awkwardly decide who answers that. Um, but do, do you want to come back on those points and then we'll uh, discuss some of the other themes that are emerging? Andy. Uh 
Yeah, I can come in first uh, on the co-benefits, first of all. Uh, yeah, ab absolutely. The, the, the co-benefits of climate action in terms of, of generating jobs, of promoting active travel, of public health, of improving air quality. Um, they, those were seen by a lot of our participants as absolutely crucial in gaining both public support and political support, getting political buy-in. Um, and I think that David said something about like mainstreaming climate action because the the most important thing for a lot of our, our participants was was presenting like rapid climate action as just the best investment choice, just the best thing to do with the limited resources and funds that you have, just the best long term decision, because doing this now will a get you all these other kind of co benefits, this other stuff as well. But it's the the, the risk of not doing it is greater than any kind of cost that there may be in doing it. And look, these costs are offset by these other things that you get. So, so actually, yeah, framing climate change as being at the center of uh, a kind of uh, a strategy that brings a lot of other benefits along with it was, was seen as kind of absolutely central to a lot of our participants, yeah. Anything you yeah. want to add to that, David? Yeah, no, I'll just, uh, I think that leads on nicely to the, the second question actually about the institutional position of uh, tackling climate change. Um, I mean, from what we could see, we didn't specifically ask that question um, to, to be clear, but, um, you know, thinking about it uh, in the light of that question, it, it was clear that, um, you know, relating also to what Andy was just saying about framing, uh, that it, it made a difference uh, in terms of what the council could do and what they were actually doing where in the council climate change was situated and I, I saw in your um, in brackets in, in the chat uh, that you know the suggestion that maybe it's most effective when it's associated with um, uh, economic issues um, it's it's uh, it's anecdotal evidence that we have to go on I'm afraid but uh, I, I would agree with that and what we did see to, to some extent uh, was that uh, those who really felt that they they could as it were, uh, square the circle that Polly was talking about to take, um, turn the, the yes but to the yes and uh, were engaging with it from a position in which their portfolio may have had explicit economic uh, aspects rather than being a uh, sustainability, uh, uh, only a sustainability uh, agenda. Hey, yeah, I, I want to, sorry, Andy, did you want to come in? Uh, yeah, very quickly. So, as David said, it's it's kind of anecdotal. You, you know, to to see if the positioning in the council had a real impact, you'd have to do you study a lot more councils. But one thing that we did hear from each of those councils was that there was a need, uh, both for like a climate unit or someone responsible for climate policy, to be positioned centrally and you know quite high up in the council, but also not for responsibility for climate action to sit just with them climate has to be like distributed across all departments because and that, that was one of the big things that, that came up um, uh, both councillors and officers saying well great we've got this target but we have no idea how we're going to be how, how that's going to play down into service delivery plans for for waste or for social care and we don't know how that's going to be reported back on so it needs to be a central position but also needs to be you know distributed as well responsibility has to be Kind of permeated throughout the council but then you get into the problem of kind of mainstreaming it just gets diluted and uh yeah seen as just another priority amongst so many others great okay let me come back to the panel on this point of where they think climate should sit i mean obviously the answer is everywhere but on this debate about sort of mainstreaming versus specialism um, i'm interested to hear your thoughts on that and also on the question of um, how closely you tie it to uh, a sort of economic regeneration agenda. Um, I know, uh, Polly, you want to come in. Uh, Tom, I'd be interested to hear as well from your experience in Leeds, is that, what are your thoughts on that? I'll go to Tom and then... Uh, yep. Okay, yeah, thank, I, I think in terms of where it sits, I think it depends very much on the local authority's scale and size. Um, so Leeds is a very big local authority, um, and so I sit in a, a, a kind of a, a climate unit, um, uh, and we have a, 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 a director, so a, the most senior officer, if you like, who 
who um, sort of you know, champions this uh, across the authority and very conveniently is also the director of finance, which helps. Um, uh, I think um, in terms of links to e economic um, uh, focus, I think Leeds has only made the progress it has because we've made the links to, to economic development. Um, all the way through that I, I've been working on this in Leeds, we have been presenting this as this is a way for the city to become uh, more efficient, more resource efficient, more competitive, opening new markets, creating new jobs. Uh, that's, that has, uh, you know, the, the the environmental benefits is has been oh and by the way we'll this will help reduce our uh, our, our carbon emissions but certainly that has been the um, the, the main argument um, if you like that we have used to promote um, the, the 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 projects and the strategy that, that that we've taken I think I think it's kind of been essential and uh, it's been it, and we've been making that argument for a long time um, uh, because I think uh, originally. Um, I think this kind of work was seen as some sort of threat uh, to economic development that this was going to hinder. But now I think that that uh, kind of dialogue has definitely changed. Um, so, you know, why would you um, promote um, economic development that actually uh, damaged the uh, kind of environmental credentials? You're not, you know, Leeds wants to attract, you know, sort of big events, um, uh, sporting events, cultural events to the city. They're not going to come to a city that is congested with um, uh, air pollution or, you know, you can't dispose of their waste or they're at risk of flooding, all those kinds of things. So um, I think we that, that has been our, one of our key arguments. Great. Thank you. Polly? Hang on. Right, thank you. Um, yeah, I would say that Leeds is actually quite a good example. When you when uh, the the former leader um, Judith Blake, who's now uh, gone to the House of Lords, made a very uh, you know three ideas at, at once is more than enough for anybody, right? They had three targets, which is a healthy Leeds, um, a, a, an economically growing Leeds, and a climate change friendly leads, right? One that was tackling climate change. If, it, if something doesn't do two of those three things, then it doesn't get done. It's really simple, right? Mm -hmm. And it stops all that faffing about, about, oh, well, we'd better do the carbon assessment, blah, blah, right down here. Or, or, and then, then they go, oh, we haven't got the capacity to do that. So we won't, so we won't do the thing, right? Or we won't do the carbon assessment. Either ends up being useless. It's the way of slowing things down. Town hall treacle is everywhere. And it is done deliberately to stop the in interesting things happening or useful things happening. If you say, if you don't hit these as our strategic goals, then your job, then you, you failed in your job. It really sends a strong message. So yes, we could spend lots of time about on the organogram of where it should sit in the cabinet, right? Uh, fundamentally, Leeds has done a really important thing by allying it with the finance team in terms of the officers, because finance is where everything happens. Right. It's about the money. Stupid. They get a certain amount of money in. They, sp they spend a certain amount of money on services. If it doesn't pass the smell test with them, you're absolutely screwed anyway. So do that. And then if it's if you're talking about the cabinet, the closer it is to the leader, the better. Don't make it the leader because they'll have too many other things on. But the closer it is to the leader, the better. Make sure the leader owns it as an overall strategy like Judith did. And then make sure that wh whatever it is, you've got some kind of cross cabinet response uh, um, uh, system underneath it, which means everybody has got to be accountable to that. So su um, sustainable procurement can't just think about things on, uh, on sustainability, which doesn't include that. Your regeneration people have to answer to that. Your, ha your housing repairs have to answer to that. Your social security, what are your, not, your social services, how are you designing that? One of the biggest challenges Salford had when they were introducing their EV car club was the social workers. Now, I'm not surprised. Think about how st stressed I was just one Saturday morning on those surgeries. Imagine your life is dealing with families in complete trauma. And then somebody says to you, we're going to take your car away from you, which is the way you get around between traumatic incidents. And we're going to give you one that you just share with anybody. So you don't have your things around you and you don't know whether it's safe and you don't know whether it's going to run out of juice. Right. So the biggest resistance can sometimes be that. And I think that's why we need to think about making sure that you've got an integrated thing and people under you understand where people's resistance comes from. And that really helps. Can I just say one thing? Because people have been asking in the chat how external 
um, uh, organizations can help. Quite Matt, often, you're going to come yeah, to yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, that's one of the themes I'd, I'd like to come to. Is that all right? Great. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So just on this on this sort of mainstreaming specialism point, uh, Seamus, you wanted to come in and then um, Joanna, I'll give you a chance and then I'm going to move to some of the questions in the chat. So uh, Seamus. Oh, sorry about that. Um, well, actually, uh, the, the the point I wanted to come in is is you asked as well about the kind of tying in around um, economic development and uh, you know what's the kind of best approach to that. And I suppose from Belfast's point of view, um, because of the the legacy of the troubles, we have a very kind of unique. Um, economic structure to our city, which is that there is a city centre, but there's not a huge amount of people living in the city centre. So much of the kind of economic activity over the last year, because of lockdown, has been in the neighbourhoods, or as we talk about the roots, the main kind of uh, thoroughfares in and out of the city. Uh, and and I, I very much see the kind of opportunity for us in terms of economic development and link, linking climate action, particularly kind of base-based climate, climate action which is, I think, really the the, the avenue, um, no pun intended, uh, which most kind of constituents are contacting us about, uh, as being able to link those two together in terms of economic development of our roots and economic development uh, or, or development of face-based uh, climate action. So looking at, at things like opening up space for pedestrians and active travel, rather than them being spaces purely for, for uh, motor vehicles, uh, looking at how we use green space and, and uh, Polly really hit the nail on the head for me when she said about town hall treacle I have really come across that issue uh, or, or that approach in, in relation to the issue of uh, market gardening and um, you know urban farms which is something that we are trying to push in Belfast but there is significant institutional resistance to the idea uh, for whatever reason we can't get to the bottom of it but, but again, linking, you know, th those are all part of kind of place-based action that we want to try and see around uh, th those kind of main thoroughfares and neighborhoods uh, that are, I suppose, somewhat unique to Belfast because of the legacy of the troubles that people didn't live in the city center. So the economic development of those areas is uniquely tied to how we use space around them. And the more that we can do to open that space up to people, you know, we, we have seen the research that has come back from other cities, uh, the best example local to us being in Dublin, where retailers are seeing a huge increase in the amount of footfall and people actually spending money because spaces have been opened up to pedestrians instead of to cars. Great. Thank you. Uh, Joanna, is there anything you'd like to reflect on on this sort of structural issue? Yeah, I mean, for, for, for me, listening to this, and especially listening to Polly um, talk, talking about it, and she talked about cabinets, Scotland, Ever since we've gone to, since 2007, and local government reorganisation, we basically run committee systems. And actually, this is about delivery. It's about lining things up. It's about collective responsibility. And because of the proportional representation, it's felt that across, I think, every, cap, every council in Scotland runs on a, a council, a committee system rather than a cabinet system. And for me, there is just so much inbuilt inefficiency there that even when you get onto, I mean, Edinburgh's on its third reorganization since I've been a councillor. Uh, so it's on its third big structural reorganization in 14 years. Um, so are our energies directed outwards and towards delivery? No, they are directed to navel gazing, the writing of multiple plans which conflict about with each other um, and, and not getting on with the day job. And I was, I was quite, I mean, a lot of people, someone said, oh, Edinburgh's got transport sorted out, managed to hear that. Well, we actually, we haven't. If you look at our baseline figures, I would say, and I'm an opposition councillor, so just in case anyone thinks that I'm actually in control, I'm not. We're very much an opposition councillor. I, mean, um, I would say actually our baseline figures are quite good. There is a progress, but because there is very little cross-party working, there's very little uh, focus on delivery, um, we are seen, I would say we are always seen as the pragmatists and the, the, the buts, when actually we're, we're not. We're trying to probably be more entrepreneurial about saying, what have we got? How do we use that to best effect and deliver against these targets? Um, and where does it sit? Well, I 
we have recently tried to stop having multiple plans and get more streamlined planning. So all our spatial thing sits in our statutory plan that we have to deliver our local development plan um, and not have a city mobility plan which has spatial things in it. We say stick that all together because what's statutory, what gets measured, it gets done. So it's about placing things where they get measured, where they get done and holding people to account and delivery. And for me, that's about a streamlining of organizations and processes. I mean, I will take so many of Polly's ideas away about saying, you know, just thin this down, three things, does it meet two, can we deliver it? Because we flannel far too much. And that I think is our, everyone's very busy, but we're not going very far because we're sort of in a bit of a head spin at the moment. It would be my opinion, although people will tell you we're doing a lot, but there's very little delivery, lots of words, not a lot of action. That, that town hall treacle again, maybe. I've also heard it called paralysis by analysis, which I, I quite like. It's a special, uh, special phrase for us academics. Um, great. Thank you. So I'm going to open out now to questions from uh, from other participants in this meeting. Um, we, um, we haven't got the upvote thing on this version of Zoom, so I'm just sort of picking out themes from the chat. Um, I'll start with a, a, a couple that have jumped out, but just to say um, if you do have uh, themes you'd like uh, addressed or specific questions, um, do put them in the chat. And also um, there's been quite a lot of chat, so if you asked one early on that that hasn't uh, that I that I haven't come to, feel please feel free to pop it in again at the bottom. Um, so a couple of the themes that I'm going to start with are firstly, um, and Polly alluded to this. Um, there was quite a um, quite a uh, discussion. There's, there's there's been some themes emerging about the role of essentially community-based or third sector initiatives and the extent to which if they link up with local authorities, that is a good way of, of pushing this forward. Um, I think um, Anthony from, from CAT was raising that point. Anthony, if you're still with us, I don't know if you wanted to um, unmute. Um, Andy, have we allowed, can we change the settings now so that people can uh, be seen and heard? Um, and um, Andy, if you're there and want to ask the question directly, please do. Hi, yeah, got unmuted now. Great. Yeah, I was just really, I was just really wondering whether the research had shown much appetite or recognition amongst the local authorities for working with the communities um, and in partnership, really. Great, thank you. So, um, Seamus, I know this has been a theme for you in Belfast, and Polly, you wanted to come in on this. Let's start with 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 you two, uh, Seamus. Um, so, there was a significant amount of, of work um, done. I suppose in the Belfast Resilience Plan in terms of community engagement, and it was quite interesting, actually. I suppose to look. Uh, the, the priorities that, that the public set um, compared to, I suppose, some of the pressing uh, policy priorities that very clearly haven't been terribly well communicated to the public because, uh, you know, we did the very old fashioned um, sticker test, the, the big kind of chart with the, the different issues that we asked people to rate as priorities and gave everybody three stickers and asked them to, to place a sticker uh, on you know, each subject area. And, and the number one area where we actually have to get the work right in Belfast, where there's a serious problem at the moment, is about uh, wastewater infrastructure. And nobody placed any kind of uh, mark around anything to do with water infrastructure. So that, that's a huge challenge for us um, to actually, you know, the, the feedback from that is we need to do a better job of communicating what some of the challenges are that we face. Uh, our wastewater infrastructure is operating at about 150% capacity at the moment. Uh, because it is just so outdated and will probably require investment into the billions in order to try and make it uh, uh, sufficient. So that work started in January of 2020 and I was at a couple of the engagement sessions and they were really, really good. Some excellent ideas coming forward from the public and then COVID happened. 
Yeah. And I would be honest in saying I um I reckon that not enough work has gone on in terms of that kind of official level of engagement since uh, the pandemic. And I understand that a significant amount of that is because the bandwidth of our organisation as a council has been stretched to capacity. That, however, hasn't stopped the, the elected members from going out and doing their own engagement in relation to these issues. And I know from you know, the discussions that we had uh, in, in, as part of the research that you know, we, we kind of made the point continuously about the difference between the council before our last election and since the election. So I was elected for the first time in May 2019, along with around about a third of the council coming in new as well. And that new third have really, I think, spent across the different political parties. We have eight parties in, in Belfast City Council uh, and no, no one has an overall majority. Uh, but across the different parties has spent lockdown actually out engaging with, with residents. And again, <clears throat> much of the focus has been on that kind of face-based action uh, yeah. around climate issues. So uh, I think the members are doing a good job to go out and engage with, with the public, but I think there is a significant amount of work that needs to be done by the council uh, corporately to pick up the engagement work that went on in relation to the resilience strategy, which was really good and, and helped to feed into all of that, uh, but to pick up then on our kind of further climate priorities uh, after that. Uh, and that's something you know, we, we kind of continue to press with officers. Again, the issue is that we are facing that institutional resistance around the bandwidth that the organisation has to deal with these issues. Sure. Okay. We keep trying to tie them back into COVID recovery because yeah. ultimately, yeah. The, the two are, are intrinsically linked. This is the best opportunity we've got. I mean, nobody wants a global pandemic, but at the same time, the reset button had to be hit because of COVID. Now is the perfect time to say, well, if we're building, uh, rebuilding structures and, and how we do things, this is the perfect opportunity to, to make change happen. Great, thank you. Okay, I'm going to come to Polly about, about community engagement, both in terms of outreach and more formalised sort of partnership working with community organisations that might be energy companies or, um, you know, local charities, whatever that might be. And just um, by way of signalling, I'll come to you, Polly. And then, Tom, I'd be interested in another, another topic that's been raised in the chat is the role of um, citizens' juries and deliberation, which, as many of you know, is something that, 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 that that's my day job, basically. I, I, I work on these issues. So, Tom, I'd be really interested to know your experience of um, what role your climate citizens' jury played in, in local climate action. Um, and also um, Kevin Freer, who's on the call. Uh, Kevin, be prepared. I might come to you after Tom, because uh, I know you've, you've, you've done a huge amount of thinking about this. So Polly. Yeah, I think what's really important is, um, I think what we're getting is a lot in the chat. It's like, how can local authorities engage with us? Because we all know, right, okay, and fine. Local authorities and councillors are elected to serve everyone. And just because you think you know what you're talking about, and you're the noisiest person and you've got the email of the councillor doesn't mean you're necessarily the, per the first person that should be at the top of the list and that's really difficult for climate campaigners to understand and I know because I've been campaigning on a range of issues since I was about 14 which let me tell you was well before there was such a thing as email and I was <laughs> typing out my letters to the councillor on my dad's old typewriter right so just because you know how to put the postcode in for the town hall which was my kind of big win then doesn't mean you should be listened to or you're necessarily the priority, right? So it's understanding again, where and how you build up a legitimacy to be the person, to be the, the people that the local authority should engage with. And that is about having an answer, right? And having a wider range of supporters and allies because that's, what, and, and particularly about mainstreaming it. Local authorities need to be thinking, who has got some answers but also, how do I deal with this in a way that meets the needs of people who are not necessarily thinking about this all of the time, but everybody else who isn't thinking about it all of the time and who could have an impact on it? And that's that's the balance that needs to be taken up. I'm, I'm talking about this literally as I'm looking at my own Twitter feed, because last night bollards in our low, low traffic neighbourhood in my ward were lifted, even though we'd replaced them yesterday and hidden because we have got militant anti-low traffic neighbourhood campaigners in the in the uh, by-elections in uh, in Hackney right now and 
what I've got to be able to make sure that people understand why we are doing this and continue to show, demonstrate the leadership. What was really interesting about what Seamus said is if your problem is water, you've got to demonstrate leadership by saying the problem is water, mate. I'm, I can spend all of my time doing your little thing over here, but if I want to do big stuff, I've got to do this. And building the coalition of support for the big thing you've got to do is actually what being an elected councillor is all about. Great, thank you. So one thing you raised there, Polly, is, is hearing from those people who might not have naturally started writing to their local mayor at age 14. <laughs> um, but I, I think, I mean, that's a really crucial point because if you, you know, as, as, as many people on this call do, spend a lot of time working sort of within the climate community, you, you, you know, it, it's, it, you, you get that climate bubble effect, don't you? So, um, Tom, how did uh, the experience of Lead Citizens Jury, did that help you to sort of reach out beyond the bubble. Can you tell us a bit about that? Uh, yes, it was uh, certainly a positive experience. Um, it's important, uh, the experience of, of Leeds' uh, citizens' jury on, on climate change, um, which took place pre-pandemic, um, uh, uh, it has to be seen in the context of, of the, um, the, the wider uh, engagement that the council was engaged um, with at the time. So at the same time, or the summer before, if you like, uh, the council had had decided to do what they called a big leads uh, kind of climate conversation, which was essentially an online survey. Um, uh, but uh, the council worked really hard, and I was in the team that did that to make sure that we weren't just going to the usual suspects, um, who always uh, reply to uh, uh, climate questionnaires um, and surveys. And so we took that um, online survey. Um, out into the community so we went to masses of community events basically everything from fates uh you know jumble sales schools uh ed sheeran concerts uh, all that kind of stuff to make sure that people uh i mean it was a very simple uh, questionnaire um uh, you know we had ipads you know so that people could fill it in um and we were very pleased when we got the results back from that because we actually had over representation from groups that are usually underrepresented so so that's like the sort of wide but shallow um uh, engagement and then alongside that uh, the the uh, the citizens jury was was deep um, but, but but very narrow uh, because it was only with 25 people um, who were selected by an independent consultant to be you know representative of the city as a whole in terms of age gender um, uh, you know position uh, opinion about climate change all, all those different things so it was like a sort of a mini city uh, and they went through the, the the process of listening to uh, to, to witnesses and, and 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 producing a set of results the really encouraging thing um, was that uh, the results that the citizens jury came up with their recommendations which uh, you can find on the website were broadly consistent with those that what we had uh, got um, through the kind of broader engagement. So we weren't surprised by anything that the citizens jury uh, came up. I think that certainly this, the, the jurors who, who, who took part, the 25 people who took part, and I think unusually, they all pretty much stayed the distance. Well, I think we only had one or two uh, dropout, um, uh, which I think is, is, is unusual, um, but that was really good. They, 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 they were a dedicated uh, group. They obviously benefited enormously, and we will, we, we've asked for uh, two of them to stay engaged with sort of processes in, in Leeds. Um, we, we can't afford to do um, the, 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 uh, the, the, the continual ongoing engagement. That is the downside of Citizens Jury. It is a very expensive and resource intensive process. Um, and, uh, you know, so you, you can't do it all the time. Um, you, just, you know, the money that we'd spent on that, you know, would have insulated, you know, like five or six homes, you know. Um, so uh, I think it, it is valid it, in it, and it served to validate the results, the, the opinions that we got from the, the broader survey. Um, and uh, what we what we need, I think, in terms of lessons learned, we need to do better in terms of how we go back to that group and say, look, this is what we've done with your, 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 your findings. Um, and I think we, we probably haven't because this was the first time Leeds had done something like that. We, we weren't sort of used to being in that rhythm of, um, yeah, you know, sure. that, that kind okay. of uh, engagement. But yeah, uh, overall, a, a, a very positive experience. Great. Thank you. Um, so, um, Kevin, I'll come to you in just a moment. Um, so Seamus has had to um, leave us, I'm afraid, because he was he um, he nobly joined us at the last minute. But he's he's had to go off. But thank you very much to Seamus if you are uh, if you are still with us. Um, I'm going to get Kevin's really quick point on the community issue. But there's one more substantive issue which has come up a lot in the chat, 
Um, and that is, let, let me um, signal it now so that I can come back to the panel members about this. Um, this is the question of what to do with the big high carbon stuff, the airports, the coal mines. Um, you know, it's obviously not working that well at the moment because there's huge rows about these things. I mean, like the coal mine that I'm in, that, that, that I've been working on in Cumbria, um, Leeds Bradford Airport and, 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 and so on. Um, so how can we get a decision making process which manages to deal better with big high carbon things um, I, and um, that, that's one that, that quite a few people raised in the chat. So Kevin I'm going to come to you on the community issue and then I'm going to come to each of our panellists and and in David um, to, uh, to sum up and also to tackle the high carbon point um, and then Candice can do a little bit of summing up for us. So Kevin. Yeah we used the same uh, structure as Leeds. I think it gave us a huge boost um, confidence, um, accountability. Um, we've taken all the recommendations. There are three cabinet members who they're shared between, but everybody's taking on uh, responsibility. We haven't sorted out the reporting back yet, but what we've, what's happened is that we've created several really committed uh, activists who weren't active at all before. They're engaged with us. They come to meetings. They want to see their recommendations carried through. We're gonna report back regularly. What's really great, because we're only a district council, is the county council also um, took these recommendations on board. So, you know, it's, it, it, we can only do ourselves a very small amount, but it's enabled us to go and say, look, this is really what people want, you know, get behind this. And, and, and it's just been uh, transformational, really has. Great. Thank you. That's good to hear. Brilliant. OK, so let's do that last round. I'm going to start with uh, Joanna. So I'll go Joanna, Tom and then uh, Polly and then Andy and David. And well, we, we might have to you might have to um, step aside in favour of Candice. Let's see how we go for time. We, we're running out. But um, uh, yeah, Joanna, over to you. So general thoughts from and summing up, but also specifically on the high carbon issue. Um, high carbon issue. Um, it was interesting to see the zero carbon report that was produced by the UK government uh, that reported back to the UK government recently because it was a you know it said we'll have one airport in Scotland and it will be Glasgow and everyone's going why you know I, I think um, you know that is a national that's going to be a national conversation I don't think that is a local conversation the implications of that um, will be local but again that goes back to that point about aligning those plans and please getting I mean Edinburgh's on 2030, the Scottish Government's on 2037. Actually, 2037 isn't that far away. It's only 16 years. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, these big decisions about how you reshape, because that affects all of the transport in Edinburgh. If, if they're going to say close an airport in 16 years, I need to start thinking about that now for yeah. my local development plan, because where does my transport going to go? What am I going to do? Where do I put my housing? Does that impact on that? So it's it's understanding the general what that does to your large to your local planning strategy when those big national decisions are taken. Um, we don't well we we you see the other way you could do it is the Scottish government way of having a fudge that fracking is not permitted in Scotland but it is permitted in Scotland legally. But then yeah. your Scottish government say it when you yeah. when your legal advisor is a member of your government, you know. <laughs> It's all up for grabs, isn't it? But I think it's about that clarity. Sure. I suppose okay. that's the takeaway listening to everyone in England, uh, from England and, and from Seamus in, in Northern Ireland is, you know, this would all be really, really much easier to do if we didn't have this great constitutional nonsense sitting there of making decision making and consensus really, really, really hard. Because yeah. it, even in big issues like this, you know, if that were just taken off the table, life would be much easier because we could get on with this as the day job whereas this that infiltrates and sits thank you tom yeah i think this comes back to something that, that joanna mentioned earlier on about the competencies um of of, of, of powers and responsibilities of, of local authorities those high carbon activities um you know, they're, they're, they're pieces of national infrastructure that then happen to be located somewhere they have to be uh, and and 
that that uh, that final sort of planning decision is is the is the the, the responsibility of the planning function of the, of the local authority and planning is a really feeble tool when it comes to carbon because planning is basically concerned with where something is and what color it is you know it's really not concerned with um the resource consumption of that activity that's that, that isn't within the jurisdiction of, of planning um uh, you know you know it, it Leeds Bradford Airport it was basically giving permission to a building um, <laughs> uh, you know I mean and that's all it could do um, so so it's we've got the wrong the wrong tool in the box <laughs> um, no. for a local authority for a decision that has effectively already been made at a national scale so I think it comes back to this point about you know whose responsibility for what and what is the framework you know Leeds is revising yet again its its planning policies, and the new suite of planning policies will be much stronger um, when okay. it comes to climate change. So, you know, uh, if you had a, a further application, there would probably be more grounds to, um, to 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 refuse it. But at the time, that was all the the, the planning officer could do. They could have, you know, that the council could have said, "Yep, yeah, right, we're going to refuse this," and then they lose the appeal. You know, what's the <laughs> what, what, what's the advantage in, in that? So, it's it, these are these are national issues that happen to be located. Uh, somewhere um, and I think we've, we've just got a mismatch of, of tools and response and, and, and responsibilities uh, to in order to, to properly manage those those things mm -hmm. if you want to if you want to manage the resource activity of, uh, of, of, of an economic activity then you need uh, someone who has that responsibility and that's most likely to sit at a national level Okay. Yeah, I was very struck in the in the disc, in the debate in the planning committee. There was a councillor who said we are being expected to make government's airport expansion or aviation policy right here in this room, which was, I, I can see how that's an unenviable position to be in. Um, Polly, I'm going to turn to you for some very quick thoughts um, yeah. before yeah, we move to Candies. I mean, basically, I agree with what Thomas said um, about the, the the fact that currently the tools are not fit for purpose. Our piece of work, which I mentioned in the chat called Power Shift, is going to be published um, towards the end of April. Um, that is an analysis of the powers that local authorities of all tiers, but above district and above, so not town, towns and parishes in England have that they can use for net zero. And where those limit, where, where they come up against the limits of national uh, policy um, regulatory frameworks that Thomas talked about. So yes, you might have the planning powers to say yes or no, but fundamentally you don't because it's not a material condition to think about net zero. And your national government is saying, whoa, well, you know, we've got an overall carbon budget, but we'll offset it somewhere else. And I know that from having dealt with the EU ETS back when uh, I was in government before 2010. So we've got to understand what we can do with what we've got now. And that's why I'm, I'm emphasizing what's possible with what Kevin's done and other local authorities are doing and understanding where they bump, bump up against off-gen regulation, planning, national planning policy framework, national planning inspectorate, building standards, <clears throat> all of those things, highways England, right, which drives me up the wall because they don't use their powers properly to be able to, do, to reduce net zero, those things, then we lobby national government. But what we have to do as local authorities is demonstrate our ambition, not by simply doing more declarations. Fine, you can sign my declarations all you want. Then it's demonstrate and deliver the, by using the powers that you've got. And that is standing up to the town hall treacle and making sure that you can get that stuff happen. Don't allow your plan, your your officers to go, oh, very brave councillor. We'll go away and we'll do a plan about it. Work out what you can do now and do next. Work out what you need to take longer about and do later. But do not allow them to say that you cannot do stuff now until they've got a plan in place. That is the way that town hall officers slow you down and you are not in a position to do that because we cannot negotiate with the science. Great. Thank you, Polly. Andy and David, I'm really sorry, but we're out of time. So I'm going to, um, <laughs> on behalf of the team, I'm going to say that we'll keep quiet for now. Um, I'm going to hand over to Candice in a moment for, um, for a, 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 a few sentences in terms of summing up and also relating to the work of the PCAN network. Um, just to say, as ever, the, the, the party in the kitchen has been happening in the chat. Um, so we'll save the chat and send it round, uh, not, we'll send the useful links and so on uh, round attendees, because I know there's some really useful stuff in there. So we'll, we won't send every detail, don't worry, but where, the, where people want to highlight a project, we'll uh, pull that out and send it round because it might be useful to people. Okay, Candice, I'm going to give you about three minutes. Can you manage? <laughs> 
Yeah, no problem. <laughs> uh, well, thanks very much for the opportunity to, to speak today and to summarize some of the, the, the key points that have been discussed. Um, I'm one of the co-directors of the Place-Based Climate Action Network, which funded some of this work. So it's really exciting to see it all come to fruition. Uh, and we published a report last week, which was um, building on some of the conversations that have been um, talked about here. Um, so it's really encouraging to see that there are all of these declarations being made. There's so much ambition to deliver. Uh, and I just wanted to point out one thing which we flagged in our report, which actually hasn't really been discussed here, which is much of the action is focused on mitigation and we've not really discussed adaptation. So that, that is also something that needs to be considered. Um, but there was a lot of very rich discussion. So um, please excuse me if I forget any of the core points that were made, but I just wanted to touch upon a few of the, the points that were discussed. Um, in terms of uh, the, the institutional positioning to, to tackle climate change, we've heard a lot of the barriers that are, that are faced, um, but uh, some of the key points that were, that were made was that we, we need to make um, a difference in terms of where climate change is situated within a council. So this is very much cross-departmental um, and, and importantly to try and link it as much as possible with the economic regeneration agenda uh, and where possible link it to the, the finance directorates because that's where a lot of, of things are, are able to happen. Um, there was a lot of discussion around turning the, the narrative from a yes but to a yes and, so really framing um, that, that positioning in terms of enabling the climate action to, to happen. Um, and also in terms of that positioning to, to try and get it as closely aligned to the, the leader as possible without actually providing that responsibility to the leader as they're, they're so busy, but ensure that they own it and they can drive it and they can ensure that cross cabinet um, system and support. Um, and importantly, to really understand where the resistance and the barriers are and to address them head on, not to necessarily lie down and, and accept them, but really to, to address them. Um, and importantly, to, to ensure that there's an alignment in terms of the delivery targets, uh, as well as addressing any inefficiencies that may, may be hindering some of the progress. Then there was some really important discussion around community engagement and citizen juries. Um, it was really encouraging to hear that there has been less engagement since the pandemic, but actually that elected members, uh, this has been one of their core activities to go out there and engage with residents. Um, but there's a, a real acknowledgement that climate change is one of many issues that need to be addressed um, as part of uh, the, the, the broader narrative. Um, so a really key point that emerged was about uh, demonstrating leadership, but also building a coalition of support and partnerships. So partnership working is really crucial to address some of those key issues um, and, and not always to engage with the usual suspects. Um, and we spoke uh, quite a bit about juries and assemblies, and it's really encouraging to see that these tools are, are being used um, because they do also help engage with the, those non-usual suspects and they help um, build confidence and accountability of the process. And we have seen a few examples of where some of the members of the juries have actually been invited or have actively shown that they want to be engaged in further processes um, and, and to help keep local authorities to account. Um, and for example, in, in Croydon, I was sitting on their Croydon Climate Crisis Commission and they actually inv invited members of the citizen jury to sit on the commission as well as commissioners. So really to enable that follow through. Uh, and then finally, the, the important issue of, of managing those high, the high carbon stuff, as you called it, Becky, um, really important um, issue. Uh, but much of this is very much part of the national debate, the national discussion. So there needs to be a lot of um, forward and future planning and thinking um, and considering the implications for local planning strategies and how this all fits in. Uh, and importantly, just to finish up, one of the core messages that were coming was coming out was very much that um, we have the wrong tools in, in the box for this decision making processes. There's a real mismatch in terms of what's happening at the national level and what needs to be delivered locally. Um, and uh, that local authorities do need to demonstrate more, more ambition that it, it's great to be delivering these um, or making these emergency declarations. But um, now the work needs to be done to actually implement some of these plans and, and be quite forceful in them. So I, I hope that does a little bit of justice to everything that was Discuss. That was that was amazing, Candice. Thank you very much. Uh, re really, really great. Um, so we're going to end it there. Let me just finish with some thanks. Firstly, to uh, the PCAN Network, um, who together with Lancaster University funded this, this research, and we've been in a constant dialogue with them. That's been really, really useful. So thank you. Um, 
and uh, thanks to everybody who uh, who took part in the research at a difficult time. Um, we we delayed the research because of COVID, but we're still aware that a lot of people we were talking to were also, as Polly said, dealing with all kinds of, of really difficult stuff. So thank you very much to them. Um, thank you to our amazing panelists for your um, for your willingness to engage in the debate and really to get under the skin of some of this, and uh, to everyone as well for coming along and um, and and sharing your experience. We will, um, the, the, the uh, briefing on the research is now on the PCAN website. We'll send you a link to that. Um, and we'll also send the uh, links of other useful initiatives from the chat. Um, and um, there's, I know there's some stuff that's been talked about that UK 100 are publishing, which will be out in, in, in April. So we can share that as well when it's out, if you'd like, Polly. Um, so thank you very much. I'm off for a coffee in the Cumbrian sunshine and um, I, I hope that you can uh, do likewise, but really nice to see you all. And thanks very much again. Bye everyone.